want for here are some truths that should help us all to learn to wait patiently, even expectantly, upon the Lord. Here's the first one. God has a plan. God has a plan. God has not never had a plan. God has always had a plan. In Isaiah 14, 24, God said, Surely as I have planned, so will it be. As I have purposed, he says, so will it stand. God does not react. God initiates. God is not waiting for something to happen. God is making things happen. God is never delayed. God is right on time. God cannot be diverted. God's will will be accomplished. God has a plan. And I think that's good news. Proverbs 21, verse 30, there's no wisdom, no insight, no plan that cannot succeed against me, says the Lord. Isaiah 14, 27, for the Lord Almighty has purposed, and who can thwart him? His hand is stretched out, and who can turn it back? Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans of a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. I love those verses. Remembering that your good God has a good plan helps us in the way of life. But we need to also remember, based upon the Christmas story, that number two, God's plan often is advancing unnoticed by us. I love this in the Christmas story. So many of the things that happen in the Christmas story went unnoticed. Have you ever thought about that? Think about the private setting where the angel of the Lord appears to the priest, Zechariah. He's in this cramped space called the holy place in the temple. It's just him. They were the only two people in the room, the angel and Zechariah. And by the time the conversation is over, Zechariah is struck with muteness. He's unable to tell people what happened, what he had seen and what he had heard. Apparently, what happens in the holy place stays. <laughs> Think about the private conversation between the angel and this young girl named Mary. She's all alone, as far as we know, when the angel speaks to her. This conversation is completely off the record. No one else is privy to the details. The angelic visit was just for her. People all around her waiting for God to do something, and underneath their noses, guess what? God's doing something. Who would have ever imagined that the taxation of a Roman emperor would be the means through which the pre-incarnate Christ would be taken to Bethlehem to be born? Nobody foresaw how this new unjust tax would be the means through which God's plan would move forward. And that's exactly what happened. And remember that little town of Bethlehem? Just a few miles from where all the important things happen in the big city, capital city of Jerusalem. Who would have thought that the sleepy village of Bethlehem would become the center of one of the most wonderful events in the history of the world, the birth of a Savior? We know that only a few magi even noticed that the birth announcement of the King of Kings was written into the stars. It was unnoticed to most people. Or how noteworthy how noticed is a barn or a manger, and yet they become the delivery room for the Savior. Shepherds were perfectly ordinary common people, and that's why they were unnoticed, but they were the first recipients of the angelic message that night Jesus was born. Friends, all of this happened underneath the noses of people who were waiting for God. He was coming. They were waiting for God's plan to unfold. It was unfolding. So when you consider that, that should give us hope. When you think that he isn't on the move, maybe that's exactly when he's really at work. We need to remember that he uses obscure villages and angelic visitations and nighttime dreams and dusty old prophecies and bearded women and questioning husbands and teenage girls and dusty barns and starlit nights. 
we need to remember that God uses singing angels and sleepy shepherds and provincial governors and surrendered people. Nothing can get in the way of what God's plans are. Not evil tyrants, not aged bodies, not misdirected steps, not unfair taxes. What God purposes, God accomplishes. This is what the Christmas story teaches us. God has a plan. And God has every resource imaginable to deliver his plan right on time. No matter is too trivial, no detail is too obscure that is at the disposal of our almighty God to deliver on his promises of goodwill to all people. So don't lose heart for the things you're waiting on God for. Never lose heart. Don't make an agreement with the lie that your prayers aren't being heard. Don't believe that God isn't involved in your life because he is. God says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future, Isaiah 29, 11. God is working. God is moving. God is orchestrating. God is initiating. God is unstoppable. He can use anything to accomplish his purposes in the lives of his people. We dare not throw away our confidence or our hope. And don't try to figure out, this is, this is me, right? I'm always trying to figure out, oh, I think this is what God's going to do. As if, you know, I'm the brains of the room, right? <laughs> We don't need to figure out how God's going to do it. We need to be in tune with the truth that he is going to do what he's determined to do. That's the point. So let's wait patiently. Let's thank him in advance, knowing that he is right now at work. Right now his work is being accomplished. Let that prevail in our hearts so that we're yielded and still and trusting in him across the span of time of waiting. I think that's the posture that we need to have. So now up until this point in our message, we've looked at some of the historical context of waiting, but I want to take two personal stories now in the Christmas story to draw a little bit more out. And I want to talk a little bit more about Zechariah's story. Zechariah and Elizabeth became the parents of John the Baptist, who some people believe was the cousin of Jesus. The Christmas story chronicles the pain of their waiting. They had been waiting a lifetime of marriage, but they were still childless. They had prayed for a child. They had longed for a child. They had waited for a child, but the child never came. Did they ever wonder if God's plan they had somehow been forgotten or worse? left out. Yeah, probably. But one day, as was the custom of the day, lots were cast to determine which particular priest from a particular division of the priesthood would be chosen on a particular day to go into the holy place and to burn incense in the temple. And on that particular day, the lot that was drawn was the lot that Zechariah had in his hand. Luke's Gospel tells us, when the time for burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right hand of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. There you have it. After years of waiting, God's plan for their lives was being brought to fruitfulness and fulfillment. For from Elizabeth's barrenness come the blessing. Now when Zechariah had the lot cast to him, little did he know that it was an indication that God's plan was a threat. Right? When he got up that morning and ate his breakfast, little did he know 
that God was going to send an angel to meet him in the holy place later on in the day. Little did he suspect that God was moving, or that God was at work, or that God was about to intervene and answer a lifelong prayer to be a father. He could not have possibly known that on this seemingly ordinary day, God was going to do something very special for him. And it was the day that his dusty old prayers and unfulfilled longings were answered. And what about Simeon? Simeon is an obscure character in the Christmas story. We have eight verses on him in Luke's Gospel. His brief appearance in God's Word teaches about waiting for God's plan to be fulfilled as well. So according to the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2, God has promised this saintly man named Simeon that he would not die before he laid eyes on the promised Messiah. And he basically parked in the temple because the promised Messiah would have had to come through the temple doors one day uh, shortly after his birth. <coughs> Now think about eight years of waiting for this to, to be accomplished, right? Day after day, he roams the expansive temple courtyard looking for the special child. And at the end of every day, he puts his head on the pillow, and there must have been some pain of disappointment at the realization that the promise had yet to be fulfilled. This promise that he had longed for and was waiting for. Did Simeon know days like you and I? Yeah. Did Simeon know about the travail of waiting? Yeah. Did he ever think to himself, did I really hear the Lord give me that promise? Probably. I wonder if he ever despaired under the press of time. I wonder if he ever wondered if God was really going to come through for him. So there's a lot of waiting, eight years worth of waiting between verse 26's promise and the fulfillment of verse 27, which says, moved by the spirit, he went into the temple courts. There's this quickening that took place in his spirit. All of a sudden there was this awareness. The promise is beginning to unfold. It's beginning to be revealed. The spirit gives some sort of inner witness in his heart that something's afoot. The God who had promised him years earlier is the God that was leading him in the fulfillment of that promise. And the Simeon takes the child, the Christ child, in his arms. He praises God and says, Sovereign Lord, as you have what? Promised. Love that. As you promised, now you can dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all people. Can you hear the wonder in his words? Can you hear the joy in his jubilation? The pain of waiting has been, been replaced by the praise of worship. What made Simeon's praise? So sweet. It had been seasoned with patient, trusting, waiting. For those of you who have ever felt like your life was on hold, don't despair. God has a plan, and it's right on track. And in the meantime, Begin to thank God today for the way he is working on your behalf. Prepare your pipes for praising, because God will faithfully fulfill his promises to those who wait and trust. Now, during this message, we've talked a lot about how we need to wait for God to accomplish his plan. But in closing, I want to add another angle to this topic. We are often in a position where we're waiting on God to do something, but we rarely consider how God is also waiting. Right? Because God has unfulfilled longings as well. God is waiting for all of his children to return to him. He longs for all people to enter into a right relationship with him. He has made every provision for that to happen, and he is patiently, lovingly waiting and wooing and drawing and calling all of us into a relationship with him. 
Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock, and when anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. God is waiting today for us to return home. Amen. He is waiting for you to invite him into your life. He is waiting for you to enter into a complete surrender of your life to him so that you can receive his peace and presence, his favor, his forgiveness, his plan, his purpose, and his power to live a changed life. I was grateful this morning when I looked at the bulletin. On the back side of the bulletin there at the bottom, uh, it said, I have made the decision to make Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior today. And the line underneath it says, I have committed my life to Jesus Christ today, recommitted my life. And I'm going to end in just a prayer here, a simple prayer of meditation. And if you're ready to enter into that relationship with God, perhaps you've never really taken that step. Perhaps you've heard invitations before. Perhaps you've understood this for whatever reason you've held back. But today, you want the waiting of God to end because you want to come in the right relationship with Him. Or you're ready to surrender all of your life to Him this morning. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray that prayer with me. So let's bow our heads right now. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for loving me and for sending your son to die for my sins. I sincerely repent of my sins. I receive Jesus into my life. I open the door that he's not in. And now as your child, I turn my life over to you. Jesus, come and live in my life. I surrender to you, to your love and your rule. Amen. 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 <clears throat> pray that prayer. I would love you to put your name on the back of that card this morning and take the page right off. Perhaps you can get something close to that. And get that in the Pastor Shields here. Because I know she'll want to know that and celebrate with you. Even talk to me after the service. I'm going to be enjoying a delicious pop up down the I'm waiting for it. I'm taking that by faith. But uh, it's so important that despite wherever you're at today, that you know this God is really crazy about you. He loves you. He loves you. And He wants you to be with Him forever. And He wants to renew your whole now. In love, he is actively at work in your life today. So continue as you wait to trust his kindness and his love for you. God bless you all. Thank you. Now I'm going to have you stand, and we're going to get a benediction, and we'll be this.